So, we're going to talk to the camera. Thanks. So, tease. Working in the lab, working in the lab, some of the first thing that you're going to do is to cook. You're going to cook solutions. So, I think it's helpful if we start off this lecture with a very, very, very basic introduction about how to cook solutions, working in the wet lab, how to make things that are going to be useful for your experiments. It's a very, very, very basic lecture, and it's something that's going to be very, very useful for you in the lab on your first day when you first start doing experiments in the wet lab. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi. 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 So. Hey, woman. You want some? Yes. Oh, yeah, I, I do. want me. I do. I do. I do. Okay, so I have made here a document that is a good primer, a good tutorial on what to do when you first join a wet lab. So when I say wet lab, that means like you're going into a lab that has a bench, it's got like a Bunsen burner, okay, and you're going to start to do some experiments. So in many times undergraduates during their Sometimes early, freshman, uh, sophomore, junior, senior year, hopefully especially by junior or senior year, you're going to want to start to get into a lab and start to try to do experiments, okay, in an actual wet lab, okay, doing like microbiology experiments or biotechnology experiments or any kind of biology related science experiment. You really want to get into the lab to start working on that, okay, because sort of techniques and skills in the actual lab are a little bit different and a little bit more fundamental than uh, book knowledge that you learn in the class, okay? You're going to see that there's sort of a difference between book knowledge and knowledge that actually translates to what works in a lab, producing data, okay? Producing data, producing figures, um, and, and testing scientific hypotheses in a lab through experiments, okay? So what I wanna talk about today is sort of the first things, the first most basic fundamental skill set that you need to learn the first day that you walk into a wet lab, the first day that you walk into a new environment, uh, a new lab where you're gonna do some experiments, okay? So I have here a uh, Word document, the Beckman Lab Solutions Tutorial. So essentially what we're going to talk about is how to make solutions. Okay, and if you go into a lab, what you're going to notice is there's all kinds of bottles. Okay, uh, if you walk into a wet lab, you'll see all these different different bottles. Okay, and in each of these bottles will be some kind of clear liquid. Okay. And each of these clear liquids, hopefully if people are doing things right, there will be a little label on each of these bottles, okay, with a, something written on the label, okay? And each of these are different chemicals. Like this might be five molar sodium chloride. This one might be three molar imidazole. This one might be D, T, T, you'll see all these things like this, okay? So these are what are we would call solutions. Each of these are different chemicals inside of essentially a, a solvent, which is often water, but not always water. And each of these different solutions do different things in the lab, okay? So these are like our tools. Like you could imagine if a mechanic went into a mechanic shop and there was a wrench and uh, a hammer, okay? And each of these tools, tools X, Y, Z, so on, up to N, all these tools have a different function, okay? Now in the wet lab, our buffers, our solutions, are essentially like our tools, okay? They are our toolkit, and instead of working on a car like a mechanic would, Okay, we are working in the lab by mixing in little tiny tubes, little tiny volumes of liquids, 
And in those liquids, there's little chemicals that are doing certain things, doing certain reactions, okay? And so each of these different solutions is a tool within that uh, environment. Okay, so the first point here uh, on my introduction to the basics of setting up your first toolkit in a wet lab, you need to know what a stock solution is. Okay, so let me describe a stock solution. These things are solutions, okay? But in the lab, the solutions get a little bit more complicated. There's a hierarchy of solutions, okay? There's what's called a stock solution. And there's what's called sort of a working solution, okay? So in the lab, um, like I said, there's these different tools. Let's say you set up what I'm gonna describe here as a stock solution of five molar sodium chloride. Now, what defines it as a stock solution? Well, a stock solution is different because it's usually so concentrated that none of your experiments are actually going to be using a five molar concentration. Okay, now I'm assuming you've had chemistry. I'm assuming you understand what molarity is. If you don't understand what molarity is, you need to stop the lecture. You need to go online or get a chemistry book and read about molarity, okay? So molarity is essentially like the power, the concentration of these chemicals in these solutions. So what makes a stock solution? Stock solutions are usually uber concentrated. It's so concentrated, in fact, that you're usually not going to be using this directly in any actual experiments, okay? So usually you take a stock solution and it usually is converted into a working solution, okay? So let's say you are going to do an experiment with some particular protein and that particular protein required you to have a one molar solution of sodium chloride, okay? And you might not need a lot of that. You might only just need a little bit. You might only need like 10 mils, okay? But let's say you wanted this fresh, okay? So a common thing in wet labs is things that are fresh are usually always better, okay? You kind of, you fresh stuff tends to work well. And some things need to be fresh and some things don't need to be fresh, but fresh things work well. So oftentimes what, you ha what happens is you're making this solution over and over and over and over again, day after day after day after day after day. And it gets so annoying, okay? And to make a solution, what you would do is you would weigh out the powder, you would put it into your solvent, and boom, you got your solution, okay? Now, the problem with doing it this way is it's not fast. This is very, very slow, okay? It's slow to have to go to the, to the scale, weigh out the powder, uh, put it in a solution, dissolve it, and sometimes it just, it actually takes quite a bit of time, okay? So the reason we have stock solutions, the reason we make these stock solutions is so that when, thing, when we need to make things over and over and over and over again, we don't make it from the powder, no, 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 no. What we do is we take the more concentrated stock solution, which sits on our bench, it sits on our little shelf above our bench, and we just take a little bit out of that, a little bit of liquid out of that, and we can dilute it to our working solution down here. And usually the process of dilution is fast. The process of dilution, of dilution is much, much faster. We just take a little bit of volume out and put a little bit of volume into a new solution and now it's ready to go. We don't need to remake it over and over and over again, okay? So stock solutions sort of solve the issue of constantly having to remake solutions over and over and over again. They make that process easier. So that's what a stock solution is. So here I have the definition. 
This is a solution that is made more concentrated so you can dilute it into a fresh buffer that you need. Okay, stock solutions are like your molecular biology toolkit. Okay, so now what I wanna go over is how to actually make a stock solution. Okay, now again, if you don't know what molarity is, you need to go read a chemistry book because I'm not gonna cover that here. But I'm assuming you know what molarity is and I'm assuming you know how essentially to calculate how much grams of powder would make one molar. So how do you make a solution? Well, let's do an example. How do you make a five molar solution of sodium chloride, okay? Now in the lab, how do you do this, okay? The first thing that you do is in the lab, somewhere there's gonna be a cupboard, okay? You're gonna open that cupboard and in that cupboard is gonna be some shelves with a bunch of chemicals, okay? So if you wanna make a five molar solution of sodium chloride, you're gonna go into there, into that chemical cupboard, and you're gonna find the bottle that says sodium chloride, okay? You're gonna pick that bottle and you're gonna pull it out. You're gonna look at that bottle, okay? And on that bottle is going to be a label. It's gonna say sodium chloride. Okay, and on that label, there's gonna be a little number and it's gonna look like this. It's gonna say 58.44 grams per mole, which is the molar mass of sodium chloride. Now what this actually means is, so on that bottle, it's gonna say 58.44 grams per mole, okay? And you're gonna look at that and you're gonna say, ah, I know now how to make a five molar solution because I know how to make a one molar solution. A one molar solution of sodium chloride would be exactly that number, 58.44 grams per one liter of water. Now it's not always gonna be water as your solvent, but in sodium chloride for sure, it'll be water, okay? So this, this combination, putting literally on a, on a weigh boat, measuring out 58.44 grams of sodium chloride and then putting that into a bottle with one liter of water would give you a one molar solution of sodium chloride. So how do we get a five molar solution, okay? Well, to get a five molar, five molar is just five times one molar, right? So we would take 58.44 grams times five, which is equal to 292, okay? So to make a five molar solution, we would weigh out on the scale a big pile of powder that weighed 292 grams and we would take that powder and we would put it into a solution of one liter of water. And once all that powder was dissolved, that would be equal to, and we would label it as five molar sodium chloride, okay? Now, a couple things about labeling, labeling your bottles, okay? So if this is a bottle, all your bottles in the lab, all your solutions need to be labeled, okay? There's a couple reasons for that. One is safety. We want to always know what things is. It's really, really frustrating when you're trying to later clean up somebody's solutions and all you see is just a bottle of clear liquid. You don't know if that's acidic. You don't know if it's basic. You don't know if it's gonna hurt you if you touch it. You don't know anything about it. So all solutions that you make need to have a nice label, okay? Now let me talk about how you make the label because actually there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do labels, okay? So there's tape. Imagine this is a roll of tape, okay? And you cut off, you tear off a little piece of tape and you're gonna put this tape on a bottle, okay? There's a way to do that that's the right way and there's a way to do that that's the wrong way. If you take this tape and you put it straight on the bottle, that is the wrong way, okay? That's the wrong way. Because then when later when I have to clean up this bottle, I need to take my fingernails and stab the tape 
and try to tear it off, which is really, really difficult, okay? The right way to do this is to take that piece of tape and fold it in on itself such that you create a little flap where there's a sticky part and a non-sticky part right here, okay? Then you put that on the bottle and ah, that leaves a nice little flap here that I can simply grab and pull off when I'm cleaning up the bottle later. Okay, so now that we put the tape on the bottle, we need to label the bottle, okay? There's a couple important things that you need to write. You need to write your initials, J, F, B. The reason you need to write your initials on the bottle is because some people are really good at making solutions and some people are really bad at making solutions. And if I later wanna use a solution, I wanna know that I trust the person who made that solution to know that they made it in the right way. Okay, so you write your initials. You write what it is. It's sodium chloride and it's five molar sodium chloride. Okay, got that. And now the last thing you need to write is the date. So six, 10, 20. Now this bottle is effectively labeled and we have made our first solution of five molar sodium chloride. You are now on your way to doing experiments in the lab. Congratulations. Okay, let's move on to point three. Once you start making solutions, you're gonna start to see that there's a variable called pH, which needs to be controlled. And many of the solutions we make, which are specifically called buffers, are actually a tool to control the pH of solutions that we make downstream. Okay, so this is a very important concept. If you don't know about pH, I'm not gonna talk about it here. Again, you need to pull out a chemistry book. You need to read about pH. But what I am gonna talk about is the things that we need to do to solutions to make sure that the pH is controlled properly, okay? So let's talk about that. So imagine we are gonna make a, a three molar sodium acetate solution. This is a very, very common solution that is often used to precipitate DNA, okay? We use this in ethanol precipitations of DNA. So you, this is a common solution that you're gonna make, and oftentimes you're gonna want a pH on that solution. And the sodium acetate that I work with to precipitate DNA is usually 5.4 pH, okay? So the actual, what you would see on the label is three molar sodium acetate pH 5.4. Okay. Now, how do you get it to pH 5.4? Because what's going to happen is you're going to calculate X amount of powder to weigh out, to put into the way that you're actually going to do this. You're going to put this into a beaker, a beaker, and you're going to put, let's say, let's say you're going to make one liter. You would only fill the beaker with 500 mils, which is one half the final volume that you want, okay? And the reason you do this is because you know that when you put that powder in there, it's gonna change the pH of that liquid, of that water. And the pH is not gonna be exactly what you want it to be. It's all, it's, you might need to adjust it, okay? So what we're talking about here is adjusting the pH of solutions. So as you're faced with this conundrum, the first day in the lab, you're gonna ask yourself, how do I adjust the pH? How do you do that, okay? And in your lab, you're gonna have a few tools. You're gonna to have a pH meter and by that pH meter, I bet you're gonna see some bottles that are filled with acids and bases. You're gonna see things like a bottle of hydrochloric acid, uh, acetic acid, phosphoric acid, okay? Near your pH meter, near and around your pH meter. So what you're gonna do is the first thing to answer this question is you need to know what the pH is after you added all that powder in there, okay? So you gotta measure that. So you set up your pH meter, 
you stick your pH meter in the liquid and there'll usually be a stir bar there stirring and you might be setting it on a hot plate, okay? You might be heating it a little bit to get that powder to go into solution, okay? So once you get a reading on the pH, imagine that the pH reading of what you're seeing is something like seven. I don't know what it's gonna be, but imagine it's like seven. All you know is you know you want something that's pH 5.4. So you need to lower that pH, okay? Now, if you understand chemistry, you know that what you're gonna be adding then is you're gonna be adding some kind of acid, okay, into that solution. But you're faced with choosing what, what acid should I be adding into this? What acid should I take from near and around the pH meter where you keep your acids, and what should I be putting into that solution to change the pH till it becomes lower and hits 5.4. Well, the rule of thumb here, and this is the important part, okay? This is the rule of thumb, which means like this is like the general rule. The general rule is you look at the chemical that you're making, and the rule is you don't add anything new. So let me explain that. Well, what's already in there? There's sodium and there's acetate. And your choices of acids are hydrochloric acid, which is going to add chlorine. You don't want to add chlorine in there because the chlorine's not already there. So you know it's not that one. No. Phosphoric acid. Uh, you haven't added any phosphate into sodium acetate. So you don't want to add phosphate. So the answer is no. But look acetic acid. Acetic acid is acetate. And there's already acetate in that buffer. Ah, so this is the one you want. You want to add some acetic acid. Okay, so then you'll take a little glass pipette of acetic acid and you will drip acetic acid into your new solution until the reading on that pH meter changes to 5.4. Then, once it's been pH'd, this is a verb, pH'd, that means you changed the pH to X, whatever you wanted it to be. In our case, it was 5.4. Once that's done, you take that beaker of that solution and you pour it into a graduated cylinder, okay? And it should be about half of the volume that you were originally intending to make. Then, then raise the volume by adding water to your final volume. And this will give you your final solution, which should be 3 molar sodium acetate pH 5.4 done you're so good you're so good okay next topic about solutions is number four there is no objective truth that means for each solution each solution is different each solution has different rules don't follow one rule for all solutions some things can be heated to get them into solution. So you might have trouble getting a powder into solution and you gotta heat it up to get it into solution. Uh, to get it into solution. But some things cannot be heated. Sometimes that heat, if you heat up that chemical, it's gonna cause it to break apart, okay? So some things cannot be heated. Some things can be autoclaved, okay? Autoclave is a sterilization process that requires heat and pressure and steam to sterilize things. Some chemicals can be autoclaved. Some chemicals cannot be autoclaved. Some things are insoluble at certain molarities. So you might try to make 40% galactose and realize that you can't make it because it only goes into solution at 20%, okay? Some things are insoluble at high concentrations. Some things are soluble in water, okay? Some things are not. So in some cases, you might need to use ethanol as your solvent. 
Some things can be frozen. Some things cannot be frozen. Some things need to be frozen. So oftentimes things like reducing agents, DTT, they need to be kept fresh and they need to be frozen so that they still work, okay? Because they tend to degrade over time. So some things need to be frozen. Some things do not need to be frozen. What's the worst is when every when people, what, what, what new people do, here's, here's what new, new people tend to do. They get a little space in the fridge, okay? And they put every solution in the fridge because they think that everything needs to be kept cold. That is not true. And they waste refrigerator space by doing that, okay? Some things need to be kept cold. Some things do not need to be kept cold. And it's your responsibility to figure out the rules of the solution that you're making. Some things are perishable, meaning they get bad, they get moldy, or they degrade over time. Some things are not. Some things tend to get contaminated. Some things do not. Some things need to be filter sterilized. So if you cannot autoclave it and sterilize it by heat, some things need to be then filter sterilized. Some things do not. Some chemicals are really expensive and some are not. Okay, so what's the point of this? The point is when you decide you need to make a solution, X solution, first check on the internet, check on Google, check how most people are making that solution, check the protocols, check your calculations, check your methods against other protocols and see if you come to the same conclusion, okay? See if you come to the same recipe. Double check your recipe, okay? There's no objective truth. All things are different in solutions and you need to look up the particular rules for the particular solution that you are making. Okay, next formula. This is a formula you will memorize for the rest of your life. Concentration times volume is equal to concentration times volume. Okay, so let me explain what this is. This C1V1 equals C2V2 is the formula for calculating how to dilute stock solutions, okay? So we already made our five mil sodium chloride. Now let's say we wanna do an experiment and we wanna make a one molar, I said mil before, that should be molar. We wanna make a one molar solution, okay? And we wanna make one, let's say we wanna make 100 mils of it. How do we calculate how much of this to dilute in how much volume to make this? Well, you use this formula. The formula you need to memorize and know for the rest of your life. It will, you will learn to love it. So let's use it and let's calculate how to do this. Our first concentration is five molar. That's the concentration of our stock solution, okay? And we wanna know how much, how much of that, okay? So that's our variable, X. That's the volume that we're calculating. Is equal to, now we put in what we want. We want a one molar solution and we want 100 mils, which is actually 0.1 liter. Okay, so let's do the math and let's calculate X, okay? So we would do the one molar times the 0.1, which is equal to 0.1. And then to get X by itself, we have to divide both sides by five. So we would divide 0.1 by five is equal to x. And that actual calculation, 0.1 divided by five, is equal to 0 0.02. And that is in units of liters. So what does this mean? What does this mean? It means if we take 0 0.02 liters of our stock solution, which was five molar NaCl, and if we take that and we put that into a new bottle, it'd be just a little bit, a little bit of volume, okay? And then we fill that volume up to what we wanted, 
100 mils with water, that will be our final concentration of one molar. Okay, and if you didn't, if you don't understand what 0 0.02 liters is, that's the same as you can convert it to milliliters by moving the decimal over. That's 20 milliliters. Okay, so the way that we would actually make this solution of one molar NaCl is we would go to our stock solution, which was five molar NaCl, and we would use a pipette to draw up 20 milliliters, and we would take that pipette and squirt it out into a new tube, so there'd be 20 milliliters in there, and then we would fill it with water to 100 milliliters. And that will be our final solution of one molar sodium chloride, okay? So that is how we use our stock solutions to make working solutions using the formula concentration times volume is equal to concentration times volume. Okay. Now, the next rules are kind of interesting things that I've learned throughout my experience and time working in the lab. And I want to point them out to you so that you learn even faster than I did, okay? So number six, when you hear percent in the lab, percent can mean different things. So let's talk about that percentage. Okay, what we know about percentage is that there's usually a numerator and a denominator. Okay, to, that comes to this calculation of percent. But when you hear percent in the lab and the common talk of the wet lab, it means different things. In some cases, it means volume divided by volume. So if you see 75% glycerol, that means somebody took essentially 75 mils of glycerol and made the total volume 100 mils with water, okay? That would be a 75% glycerol solution. That's volume by volume. Now the strangest thing that you'll hear in the lab, which is, I don't know how this happened, I don't know why they do it, but you will see a percent denoted that means weight by volume. And this is very common with sugars, okay? So if you see a solution of 10% sucrose, what that actually means is 10 grams of sucrose in 100 mils of water. If you see 20% glucose, what that means is 20 grams of glucose in 100 mils of water. So, Percentage is not always a volume by a volume. Sometimes percentage is a weight in powder divided by a volume. And that you see that very commonly with sugars. So percent solutions can mean different things. And it's important to know which one you're talking about. Okay, let's move to the next point. MIGs per mil. This is another sort of unit that you will see in molecular biology wet labs. Uh, and this is very common for antibiotics or purified proteins. So essentially what I'm teaching you is that the actual chemistry like molarity, we all know what that means and we all know how to use that. But in the common every day of the lab, 
this unit is not always the unit we use. Sometimes we use percent just because it's easier for us to think about things. It's easier for us to do things quickly, okay? We're not calculating the precise molarity of the sucrose. We're just saying it's a 10% solution of sucrose, okay? You'll see this very, very commonly. And like I said, mg per mil, this is very common for antibiotics and proteins. If you have a purified enzyme, it's often displayed as milligrams of that protein per mil. So essentially, the units that you use in a textbook chemistry class are not always the units that we're using in the wet lab. And you need to be familiar with these non-canonical units so that you don't get confused. Okay, this is pretty obvious, but another common thing you'll see in the lab is you'll see this signature 50X. Okay, so what I mean by that is you might see a bottle and on that bottle there is a nice tape with a nice flap and it might say 50XTAE. Okay, so this is a solution of TAE, but it's not just TAE, it's a solution of 50X and that 50X means it's 50 times concentrated beyond what you would use it at, okay? So when we run a little agarose gel with our electrodes and we do our electrophoresis, okay? The buffer that goes in there is 1x TAE, okay? So that means what we would do is we would use the CV equals CV formula we would come to the stock solution of 50X TAE, which is 50 times concentrated, and we would say, how much of 50X concentrated volume, how much will we need to make 1X, one times concentrated solution, so you're diluting it, and let's say we wanna make 100 mils, okay? So then you would do this calculation, it would be 100 divided by 50 is equal to x, which is equal to two. So that formula tells us that we would need two mils of our 50x TAE plus 98 mils water to produce a working solution of 1x TAE. So what we've noticed is again here, the units, the units of our solution is not the canonical chemistry units. When we made the working solution of sodium chloride, it was a five molar solution of sodium chloride. That all made sense to us. But sometimes when we make buffers, we don't say five molar because there might not be just one thing in it. It works for sodium chloride because there's just one thing in it. But TAE is actually a solution of three separate things. TAE is a solution of three separate things. It's a solution of tris buffer, acetic acid, and EDTA. It's three different things. And these three different things are all at different molarities, X, Y, and Z molarities, okay? So you can't just write like you would write five molar sodium chloride, okay? So what we write is 50X TAE, okay? And that solution is not used at 50X, it's used at 1X. So there needs to be a dilution of 50X to 1X at which point we then use it, okay? So the units, again, to reiterate, the units that we use, the units that we use in the lab are not always just molarity. We use other things like percent, x, 50x, 10x, 100x, migs per mil. So again, what you encounter in the textbook is gonna be different from what you encounter in the lab and I don't want you to be confused. Okay, quick quick um, definition of terminology. 
you'll see in the wet lab reducing agents, which are chemicals that reduce disulfide bonds. And typically these things need to be fresh. So this is typically chemicals like DTT, beta mercaptoethanol. These things are often very stinky. They smell like a skunk, okay? These are reducing agents and we use them for reducing disulfide bonds. Very, very common you'll encounter this. You'll also encounter detergents. Detergents are agents that denature proteins. So very, very common detergents in the lab are SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate, tween 20, Triton X100. Detergents are very, very viscous. They're hard to, they're hard to pipette, okay? So if you ever need to make a solution of a detergent, you usually use a volume by volume, or sometimes people will use a weight by volume, okay? So it depends. And the reason they might opt to use a weight by volume is because they're hard to pipette. They're actually hard to suck up into the tube. So they might actually weigh some out and they might create a weight by volume percentage um, because it's just practically easier to make the detergent that way. Okay, point 10. Agarose is not agar. I made this mistake when I first started off and I wanna point it out to you so you don't make that mistake, okay? Agarose is a chemical we use to make agarose gels, okay? So I drew that gel box out before. When we do gel electrophoresis, there's electrodes and they run a current the thing that makes up this gel right here is agarose. Agar is what goes in plates. So microbiological plates. Agar is what goes in the plates and it makes them hard. So the reason that these things can be confused is because confused is because they sound the same, agarose and agar, and they actually have the same function. So agar is used to make media plates for microbiology. It's used to make hard media. And agarose is used to make hard gels that we run DNA through. So they actually have similar things, but the reason you don't want to confuse them is because agarose is very, very expensive. Okay. Agar is very, very cheap. So if you ever make agar plates and instead of using agar, you use agarose on accident, you just lost a bunch of money. Okay. So do not make that mistake. Do not make agar plates with agarose. Okay, so let's go to this point 11. Another point about how there isn't objective truth. When you are in the lab, you're gonna encounter lots of recipes, okay? And we're gonna, essentially what we do in the wet lab is we do like a lot of cooking, okay? And if you need to make solution A, it's gonna have a little recipe and it's gonna say, add this, then step two, add this, then step three, add this, okay? And one point I want to make is that with respect to these recipes and protocols and cooking recipes that you will encounter in the lab, some recipes cannot be deviated from, okay? Some recipes need to be followed perfectly. Sometimes though, you need to change the recipe. Okay, let me give you a particular example. It, it might be the case that you're doing an experiment and your experiment didn't work. And you might have a hypothesis for why it didn't work and it might be because you were using a particular five molar concentration of X, okay? And you might think, well, I might be able to get the experiment to work if I decrease that to maybe like one molar one molar X. So then you change the recipe, you change the recipe with your own independent thought. 
you say, I'm not going to do that. Nope, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to try and see if this works better. Okay, so the, my point is, is that in molecular biology, the bottom line is you need to get experiments to work. You want your experiments to work. And sometimes you need to change the recipe to work. And sometimes changing the recipe is going to make your experiment not work. Okay, so by practicing an experience, you will eventually develop the solution skills to figure out how to change recipes to make things work for you. That will come with time. And you'll eventually get to the point where you'll be talking to a mentor who's worked in the lab for many years and you say, oh, I have this particular problem with this particular experiment. I don't know how to get it to work. And that mentor might say, well, just add five molar Y or three molar Z. I'm just giving an example. He'll say, add this, add this to the experiment. And you'll add it and all of a sudden your experiment will work. And you're gonna to think to yourself, how did he know or she know, how did they know to tell me to do that? How did they know to do that? And I'll tell you how you develop that knowledge. To develop that knowledge, you need to view all your buffers as tools, okay? Like I said at the beginning, you got a wrench, you got a hammer, you got a nail. This is an analogy. All your buffers do different things. And if you follow the rule where you don't add anything unless you know what it's doing, then you will learn what to put in what, how to change a recipe to make things work. Because if you know what a wrench does, you know how to use a wrench. If you know what a hammer does, you know how to use a hammer. If you know what a nail does, you know how to use a nail, okay? And it's the same thing with buffer X, Y, Z. As you make these things, as you follow these recipes, you have a choice, a mental choice in your brain. You can just follow the recipe, do this, do this, do this, do this, like a robot, but then you never learn anything. Or you can make the choice, you're gonna do this, and you're gonna read online why. And you're gonna understand, you're gonna teach yourself, why am I adding this? Why am I adding this? Why am I adding this? And if you do that intellectual work, if you put in that intellectual work, you will eventually learn how to optimize your experiments and how to properly use the chemicals, which are your tools in the molecular biology wet lab. Okay, final points. If you are confused by anything on this sheet, or if you're confused about making a buffer, all you need to do is ask. Ask somebody, ask your mentor how to do it properly, and they can help you teach it. Don't make something before you know how to do it, okay? Ask, ask before making a buffer. Okay, let me just finish with this final point. What do you do, what's a nice thing to do on your first day in the wet lab? So you can imagine yourself, here's you, you just got hired at a new job and it's your first day, you go in, you walk in the door and here's your bench. Your boss shows you, here's your bench. Get to it, start doing experiments. What should you do on your first day? What should you do in this new environment? You're gonna be terrified, you're gonna be afraid, you're not gonna know what to do. There's two things you should do on that first day. And I tell you this just to make your first day a little bit easier. The first thing you should do is use this lecture to start making solutions. On your very first day of your very first job in a new lab doing molecular biology or microbiology, make some solutions. The second thing you should do is learn how to take out the trash, okay? Sometimes chemicals are difficult to dispose of and nobody in the lab likes to take out the trash. So if on your first day of your new job, if you just learn how to take out the trash 
and you take everybody else's trash out in that lab, everybody will love you and you will be the new favorite person in that lab. So these are two things you should do on your very first day of your new job in your new experimental wet lab. Good luck.